uh, and thank you for the opportunity for me to speak here today. Uh, so a short outline of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll introduce some problems we have with resistance, then the aim of my study, the species I'm working on, the samples I'm using, and resistance in this particular species, uh, then the methodology that I'm using to address my aim, and finally, I'll revisit my uh, aim with the knowledge that we now have on the methodology I'm using. So I think we're all very well aware that um, enthalmintic, oh no, sorry, antibiotic drug resistance is very well spread in the world, which is a problem. And when I was looking for some anecdotes to start my talk off, I found that the first global uh, report by the World Health Organization on antibiotic resistance actually originated last year, so only a year ago. That doesn't, um, um, still though, uh, the main conclusion of their report is very relevant. Without urgent coordinated action by many stakeholders, the world is headed for a post-antibiotic era in which common infection and minor injuries can once again kill. Not something to look forward to, for sure. So, obviously, antibiotic resistance is something that is studied a lot, and some results are quite positive. There might be new antibiotics out there, while other studies have a more dire outcome, uh, which indicate that bacteria found in tribes, people that have never seen Western medication, are already harbor resistance uh, alleles. Another type of resistance that's quite well known is resistance against antiviral drugs. So for example, people infected with HIV get treated with a drug cocktail, so uh, in order to avoid a quick ar arising of um, antiviral resistance of the HIV virus. But also there, there are already problems uh, occurring. Now, antibiotic and antiviral resistance might be well known, but something that might not come up immediately when you think of resistance is resistance against anti-parasitic uh, drugs. Um, an, ex an exception to that might be resistance against uh, malaria. So malaria um, is a parasite that is especially well spread in uh, developing countries, and uh, we have several drugs to treat this parasite. However, um, even with a drug cocktail, some parasites have become resistant to multi-drug classes simultaneously. So again, major problem. And uh, antiparasitic drug resistance is likely to become a, a bigger problem in the near future for human parasites because in 2012, the World Health Organization, together with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as several uh, pharmaceutical companies, signed what's called the London Declaration on Neglected Tropical Diseases. And what this means is that a lot of money has become available to treat and uh, research 17 diseases that are uh, classified as neglected tropical diseases, including uh, um, tapeworms and uh, soil transmitted parasites. Uh, and the problem with this is that with all that money, Lots of people that previously did not get treatment now get treated, especially children in developing countries. So the pressure for those parasites to develop resistance uh, is increasing massively. So besides the scholarly interest to know uh, why, uh, to understand resistance, we also want to study resistance in order to develop better diagnostic tools, which will allow us to detect resistance arising earlier, uh, and that ultimately will help us mitigate the prevalence of resistance, so contain resistance once it actually arises. Now, the aim of my study is to use Homunculus contortus, which is a parasitic worm, uh, to study drug resistance by scanning the whole genome for regions that are under selections due to enthalmintic or anti-worm treatment. And the ultimate goal here is to identify novel mutations that are involved in drug resistance and understanding how they originate on the one hand and also how they spread through populations. So just a few words on the model organism I'm using. It's called Homunculus contortus, and it lives in the stomach of uh, sheep and goats. It has a direct life cycle, which means that the adult lives in the stomach, but eggs are passed out through the feces, develop into larvae on the pasture, get re-ingested, and complete their life cycle. Uh, because of such a life cycle that includes a host, parasites are quite difficult to culture in the lab. Uh, but Homunculus contortus is relatively aimable for such studies, especially some of the larval stages can be cultured in the lab and studied for phenotypic uh, traits. It is also closely related to C. elegans, uh, which allows us to do hetero, um, heterologous gene expression and a testing hypothesis on gene functions. Its uh, genome has recently been sequenced. There's actually two available at the moment. And also importantly for my study, there is a very high level of enthalmintic resistance in these worms. Some worm populations are even resistant to multi-drug multi classes simultaneously, just like malaria and HIV. Uh, and the reason why this model organism is very interesting in relation to human parasites is that the drugs used to treat these parasites are the same that, as we use for human parasitic worm infections. So whatever we understand, we might be able to extrapolate to, to human, the human situation. 
Now, the samples that I'm using, it's very difficult to find susceptible populations nowadays because resistance is so well spread. Uh, but luckily, we have collaborators in Pakistan, and there they have a unique situation where the governmental farms treat, oh, sorry, treat regularly uh, every uh, few months, and they've been doing so for the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, so we assume those populations to be resistant, and there's also susceptible populations that are um, harvested from sheep kept by private individuals that generally don't treat their worm, uh, sheep. So before I go into the whole genome approach that I'm taking, I just want to give a little bit of background on other studies that have been done on anthelmintic resistance in these species. Uh, and that, first of all, is a candidate gene approach. So one of the major drug classes to treat this worm is called benzamidazoles. What these drugs do is they target the beta-tubulin um, subunits when they f normally form microtubules. Um, and because of this mechanism was known, uh, this specific gene was studied for mutations to see if they could confer, confer uh, resistance. And indeed, three mutations were found uh, that have been shown to confer resistance, and all of them result in an amino acid change that changes the structure of the beta-tubulin subunit, which means the drug can no longer bind its target. Um, yeah, and this, especially this one mutation, F200Y, is very common and is often used as a diagnostic tool to see if populations are indeed resistant or not. Now, we've also looked at this in the populations that I'm using, and indeed we find that the governmental farm has a very high prevalence of this uh, resistant mutation of 90 up to 100%, uh, while the susceptible populations only harbor t uh, 0 to 10% of this resistant mutation. And this uh, figure here just highlights where we've been sampling, and blue indicates resistant, while yellow indicates susceptible, and the, uh, the blue diagrams uh, are sampled at a governmental farm, just to, uh, to confirm that indeed those are very resistant. Now, why don't we stick to this single gene approach to study drug resistance? Well, first of all, we know that the picture that we get from them is incomplete, uh, because if we look at those mutations, they don't describe the full uh, resistant phenotype that we see. So we, need, we know there are other loci out there involved in resistance. Another point is that this approach is very biased, so we only look at genes that we a priori think uh, are involved in drug resistance, which means we might be missing other interesting regions. Now, another approach would be to resequence the whole genome. Uh, but as James Wasmuth will be talking about shortly before the lunch here in Calgary, uh, there are still some issues with reference genome quality and availability. Uh, and another major issue here is cost. Um, associated with this, and I just want to highlight that shortly using my model as a model organism as an example. So the homologous genome is about 300 megabases big. If I were to sequence that on a MySeq that I'm currently using for my pro uh, project, that would mean I can bas basically sequence one uh, worm at sufficient quality using one run. And as one run is about 1,500, including all the preparation, that means it's very expensive to sequence the whole genome. So instead, what we do is create what's called a reduced library representation. This basically means we take a subset of the DNA of, of a worm and do that for multiple worms, pool that, and then sequence. So we get a lot more data on a lot more worms for the same amount of money. And the technique that I'm using to do this is called Double Digest Restriction Site Associated DNA Sequencing, DDRATSEQ, that I will be explaining a few slides down the line. Uh, so basically what I'm doing is resequencing a targeted subset or a random subset of the genome. And for this it's important to keep in mind that, there is, that we assume there is a non-random association of mutations surrounding the locus of inter interest uh, due to linkage disequilibrium. And linkage disequilibrium here is two loci inherited together more frequently than expected by chance. And I just want to highlight how that is important for my study. So because I'm only going to sequence little bits of the genome ultimately, so the blue line here represents the genome and the red bits are, are parts that I'm going to sequence, I might not be sequencing the actual uh, uh, mutation that's causing resistance, but I will be sequencing loci around there. And because they are associated by inheritance, these will also uh, show a pattern of selection, so I'll be able to pick that up in the analysis. Now, the method that I'm using. So the way that I'm creating the subset is using uh, two different um, um, restriction enzymes that cut up the genome at specific sites. So these restriction enzymes recognize specific stretches of DNA, and they will do so the same in each individual, except, of course, if there is a mutation in the restriction site. Uh, 
then the fragments that result because of next generation sequencing, we want to sequence small bits and pieces. Uh, I select, we select a, a specific size range of those fragments, and the fragments also have to have both a cut site with enzyme one and a cut site with enzyme two. So in all, what this means is we're just very selective in which fragments we're actually sequencing to increase the overlap. Then, as I alluded to before, we want to pool different worms. In order to do so, we have to barcode them. And this method allows for barcoding on two ends, which means we can pool up to hundreds of individuals, making it a really uh, high throughput method. And then after pooling and amplification and sequencing this, uh, we'll end up uh, with several loci sequenced at more, oh, sorry, at more or less the same coverage uh, for all the individuals, ideally. So selecting the subset that you're sequencing is very important for, uh, for your study. And one thing to keep in mind here, that whatever you sequence is not necessarily a marker. So say that all the bits I'm sequencing are called tags. Again, blue, the genome, and the gray and red and green bits are bits that have been sequenced. The gray bits are the same in, all, in both individuals, so they are not informative for my further study, while red and green have differences or SNPs, so they will be informative later on. They are markers, and those are the ones that, that we're ultimately interested in. Now, things that you can do to manipulate this subset uh, include changing enzymes, because these enzymes rec recognize specific bits of DNA. If you use another enzyme, they'll recognize different bits, and you end up with different fragments. Um, another thing you can change is the fragment size that you're sequencing. So this is an in silico digestion of a genome with on the x-axis the fragment size and on the y-axis the number of unique fragments, is, fragments of that size uh, resulting from this digestion. And you can see that there is a clear skew towards smaller fragments. So if you want to have lots of tags, it's better to sequence smaller fragments. Uh, another thing you can change is the size range of fragments. Typically, I am sequencing a range of 50 base pairs, so 100 to 150 base pair fragments. If you take a wider range, obviously you take a bigger subset of, this, of these fragments and you'll get more tags out. Something else to keep in mind when deciding what the right subset is, is uh, population parameters. So if, for example, you have a very, you know there's a very high mutation rate in your species, you might be able to do with less tags because it's more likely that a tag actually is a marker. Also, uh, the su right subset depends on the objective of your study. And I'll illustrate that here. So this is a, a few papers that have used the, the double digest rat uh, approach or something similar. A lot of data, but to summarize the most important things here, this table, so uh, first the, the study, the organism, the method they're using, either double digest rat sequencing, genotype by sequencing, which is very similar, or the original rat sequencing approach. Then a column with the number of markers this stu these studies found, the genome size of the model organism they are using. And then finally, a very important column, uh, the number, um, basically the spacing between two markers. So the bigger this number, the less dense the marker map is. So it takes you longer to get from one marker to the next. Uh, and if you then look at the goals that these studies had, there seems to be an overlap with, like if you have a less dense marker map, Generally, those um, results are used for population studies, while if you have a more dense marker map, you can use it like I am to elucidate loci that are actually under selection. So then, readdressing my aim, and I'm going really fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, as I said, I'm looking at the whole genome for, uh, to look for regions that are under selection, but we don't know anything about the population dynamics of these species. We know they have a major population size, but we don't have any numbers. Um, but because we know that this beta tubulin locus is under selection as a result of drug, select, uh, drug treatment, um, we are using this as a proof of, co of concept. So we're focusing on this specific locus first because we know we have to be able to find a, a, um, a signature of selection there. Um, and then once we are able to do that, we will look at the whole genome and look for other regions that are also under selection. And practically what this means, I'm looking for 100,000 tags in this 300 megabase genome, uh, which means one tag every more or less 3,000 base pairs. And what that means in markers, we don't know yet. But to put that in perspective with the studies already out there, it's quite ambitious. We're looking for a lot of markers and hopefully a, 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 um, a high marker map too, but uh, just to avoid confusion, this is actually the number of tags that we're looking for. We're just hoping that most of them will be markers because we also deal with a species with a huge population size. Uh, 
Um, and this is quite ambitious, but it's also because we are trying to develop this technique to be a transferable technique that we can use to address other questions. So we're being very ambitious right now. It's easier to tune down than to make it, uh, than to make it, to get more markers out later on. And then this is where I am at the moment. I have about 15,000 markers. Um, and then in relation to other studies that have been looking for loci that are under selection, that means I'm actually creating um, more than likely a more dense marker map. Again, these are tags and not markers, but I think we're definitely on the right way, on the right track. So then ultimately, the future perspectives are that um, once I've determined a loci that is under a selection, I will also have to pinpoint the causal mutation. So we will be resequencing loci that are uh, interesting to ultimately identify those causal mutations. And then finally, and this is potentially outside the scope of my project, we'll be using functional analysis um, in C. elegans, as I alluded to earlier, with, through heter heterologous expression to see if those mutations indeed confer resistance. Yeah, and then finally, I'd like to acknowledge my PIs and their labs, as well as Matt Workentine and uh, Axel Martinelli for their help with the computational analyses, Mess and Jasper Bexkoa for their help with troubleshooting, and uh, Professor Kaplan, Melissa Miller, also Umer from my lab, and the University of uh, Lahore for samples and host parasite interactions and the High program for their funding. And with that, uh, I have plenty of time for questions, so <laughs> fire away. <laughs> I'm just, I might be a bit tangential to your main uh, post, but I'm a little bit curious if you just want to speculate a bit about population size, effective population size. So, you know, how do you get at that with, you know, with this kind of organism? They would seem very, very um, common, and you know, they're super abundant. But yeah. do you have any sense what the actual? No, so that's one of the problems that we have. We don't know, but I do. So one of the studies that are highlighted here, they actually use their rat data to infer something about the population size. So that's something that we'll be doing. Okay. Yeah. And that, so that is important to you. Yes, you it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, we can't hear questions very well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got a mic now. Um, Bob O'Hara uh, just tweeted um, that these drugs are sometimes used as fungicides as well. Sorry, these uh, the, the, some of the drugs that you're looking at the resistance of mm -hmm. in nematodes ha have been used as fungicides as well. And I was just curious whether you know if there's any parallels to people that are working on in more of the fungi world. Well, I'm sure there's parallels, but I'm not but aware of, uh, of that no. they are treated with the same drugs. No, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But I do know that, for example, so this mutation that we know already that confers resistance, and we're also assuming that that's present in other uh, parasitic worms, so we're also using that for other studies. But I don't know if that's re relevant for the fung fungi. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so uh, we'll, we can take um, a, a brief break and then we're going to be starting up with uh, Kate Jones and we're going to go back to the UK side. So thank you very much.